cherubim. What did they do? They spread out their wings on high and notice covered with their wings over the mercy seat. Now, who's the mercy seat? Christ is represented as the mercy seat according to Romans chapter 3. So these angels are covering with their wings the mercy seat. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. It means the mercy seat was under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, whoa, 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 the angels are not the Almighty, no. But they are the ones that cast shadow for the Almighty. Well, why doesn't the Almighty cast shadow for himself? Because God is light. I'm looking forward to sharing together Exodus 37, and it is dealing again with the subject of the sanctuary, dealing with how they were able to put together some of the vessels of the sanctuary. Today we're going to talk about the most holy place and also some part of the holy place. So we're going to look together now, we have just prayed together, and we're going to look and try to understand a little bit more of what it is saying in the Bible in regard to the sanctuary and how God has given that to the people on earth to build so that they can co-work together with the Lord so that he can dwell among them. Because remember, in Exodus 25, verse 8, it says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God wanted to actually symbolize his presence there with his people. He wanted to interact in such a way through the high priest and the priests to show that Heaven is very interested in the ministry of his people that were surrounding the tabernacle on earth. So we're going to look a little bit more into that. I'm going to share now the idea of what is here in Exodus 37. Bezalel, which is that man that was filled with the wisdom of God or the spirit or mind of God, made the ark. Now he made something, maybe even with a graven image. Now, he made the ark of shatim wood. Now, of course, this ark would have been the wood, but it was covered with gold. And you'll see something interesting here. Two cubits and a half was the length, a cubit and a half was the breadth, and a cubit and a half was the height. So it was basically a box. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without. So this one is different than everything else. This one was actually a place where something was put within the box, which, of course, we know was the commandments. And also the um, staff that budded, but also the uh, vessel that had some of the manna within it. You can read that in the book of Numbers. Now, so, they overlaid it with gold, pure gold, within and without. Now, that is really interesting because you don't just have a vessel that is covered necessarily on the outside with acacia wood within it. This one has gold inside and outside. Now it's because, of course, it's a box, if you will, right? So that's why it had it inside and outside. But there was a cover on top of it, so there was an inside of this vessel. And the inside was golden just as much as the outside. So I like that a lot, how that uh, it represents the gospel, how Christ is the box itself with the heart, if you will, being the law of God. And the mercy seat is Christ as well. You can see in um, Romans chapter 3. But that gold on the inside and the outside represents the purity, the faith, and the divinity that is summing up the life of Christ. And to me, it's uh, just what we need is a divine son that has been gifted from the Father to be able to live in this world so that he could represent his Father correctly. And that's what we have here as we're looking at verse 2. Overlaid it with pure gold within and without and made a crown of gold round about. Now, there is a crown, okay? That's not two crowns, it's a crown. And I think that's really interesting because if you recall, we've talked about before how there was two crowns on the table of showbread. We're going to see that in just a moment. But here in the most holy place, oh, by the way, the table of showbread is in the holy place, but in the most holy place, you have one crown. And then there's another thing that we're going to see later as well today that also has another crown, but it's not in the most holy place proper. It's on the other side of the veil. That would be the altar of incense. Now, if you recall, we've talked about before how in Hebrews chapter 9, when you look at what Paul is saying about the sanctuary, there were two pieces of furniture in the holy place, 
And there were two pieces of furniture that he associated with the most holy place. The two pieces in the holy place were the table of showbread and the lampstand. You can read that in the first verses of Hebrews chapter 9. And then a little bit later, when you're reading in that same section of Hebrews 9, just a little bit further, you're going to see that in the most holy place, he puts two pieces of furniture. Not only the Ark of the Covenant, which we're reading about now, but also the um, altar of incense. And why would he do that? Well, because he is focusing on that day that is approaching. Remember, he says that it is very important for us to fellowship one with another. Even as we see the day approaching, what day is he referring to? He's talking about the Day of Atonement. And of course, the in his, in his time, the symbolic Day of Atonement, which would be under the order of Melchizedek, which is being fulfilled by Christ himself, not the same as what was done in the Levitical priesthood. Anyways, what we have is um, there's the one crown on the Ark of the Covenant, which we've just read about here, in the Most Holy Place. But there's another crown with one of the pieces of furniture that's associated with the most holy place as well, which is the altar of incense. Now, of course, that's on the other side of the veil, but that incense was used during the Day of Atonement to completely fill the most holy place with smoke or with the glory, if you will, of the, uh, well, actually the incense, which would be the prayers of the saints so that the glory of God would be hidden behind those prayers or the symbolic incense, okay? So that's what's uh, being considered here. It's a crown of gold roundabout. And that crown, I believe, would be the crown for the Father, who is in the most holy place, who is actually above the cherubim, which are on the um, mercy seat. And we're going to see that in just a moment as well. So he cast four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, which is this box that is gold within and without even two rings upon one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. And he made staves, which are like uh, boards or, um, how would you call them? Let's see, bars, that's what it is. Bar for carrying, okay? So he made bars of the same kind of wood, shatim wood, which had to be um, sanded and shaped, etc., because it originally had, the acacia wood had thorns on it. So he made staves of shatim wood and overlaid them with gold as well. He put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark so that they could carry the ark. And this is exactly what we learned about before as we read about the um, Ark of the Covenant in chapter, I believe it was 25. So it says in verse 30, chapter 37, verse 6, he made the mercy seat. Now this is really interesting. He made the mercy seat of pure gold. So not anything on the inside or the outside, this thing was pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and a cubit and a half was the breadth thereof. He made two cherubims of gold, beaten out of one piece made he them. So there's one piece of gold that's connecting not only the mercy seat, which is said here, but also the cherubim, which are part of the mercy seat. And those cherubim are on the two ends of the mercy seat. And as we talked about yesterday, it was because those two angels were symbolic of always being with Christ. Christ is the mercy seat, according to Romans chapter 3, which is translated propitiation. But if you look at that word propitiation, you're going to see that it's only translated two times. The other time it's translated is mercy seat. So God hath sent his son to be for us a propitiation or a mercy seat so that his wrath will be stayed because of the broken law and he'll be able to be our high priest and mediate his blood on our behalf. So that's kind of what's going on there in, in uh Romans chapter 3. Now, here in verse 7, on two sides of that mercy seat representing Christ, there are those two angels which will continually associate with Christ. One of them is called mine angel. You can read that in Revelation chapter 22 verse 16. So you have my angel and the other one. I don't know if that's his angel or not. It just, that's not what the Bible says, but it very well could be. This angel might have an associate but this might be Christ's angel. I'm not sure I'm going to find out more in heaven. I don't have that revelation to be able to say, thus saith the Lord, but it seems like it could be that way. Anyways, you have those two angels associated with Christ, and they are the two angels that were with the apostles on the day of ascension, which in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Christ is actually taken in the clouds of heaven. And there's two angels that are standing by saying, hey, the same Jesus that you saw ascending is going to come in like manner as you've seen him go. And so, which of course would be with the clouds representing angels. So, 
you have these two cherubim made together with the mercy seat so that they are always together, never separated. I think that's a very important part of the life of Christ here on this earth. Now, I want to share something with you that perhaps we haven't talked about here in this section, but going through the book of Revelation, I was able to find something I saw really interesting. I'm going to actually share it right now. It's in Revelation chapter 18. Um, yes, chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Okay, so this is an angel in heaven. This angel comes down and lightens the earth. Okay, so this angel has the glory of God. And we know that because the angel came down from heaven. And that's where the heaven is right there. Now, he cried mightily with a strong voice, and he was saying something other than what was happening in heaven. It's actually what's happening on earth. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Wait a minute. Babylon, representing the confusion of this world and the false doctrines and various uh, agents that are making up that false system, they have become a place where there is a habitation. And it's not a habitation of like rabbits or, you know, various trees. It's a habitation of devils. Now, what is a devil? It's a fallen angel. Okay, so this angel comes from heaven, having the glory of God to lighten the earth. And his message is, the people in Babylon are surrounded with demons or devils. And it's the hold of every foul spirit, which we know a foul spirit is not a holy spirit. It's an evil spirit, one of the fallen angels. So you have devils, right? You have foul spirit. And it is a cage, kind of like a habitation, it's a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So the unclean and hateful birds are those that have wings, right? That's what birds have. That's kind of the same thing as devils, because they have wings as well as angels. And that's the same thing as a foul spirit, having wings as angels. So I think you have three different ways that demons are described. Devils, foul spirit, and unclean and hateful birds. Now what we, what we have here is Babylon... And those that are there are surrounded with demons, with evil spirits, or unclean and hateful uh, fallen angels. Okay? The reason why is they've drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, which is the woman, the false woman, Babylon. Now, notice, I think this is fascinating because what we have here is Babylonians completely surrounded with unclean spirits, demons. Whereas those on God's side, they're spending time with the angel that's lightening the earth with the glory of God. So you have a separation between the goats and the sheep. Okay, you have those that are surrounded with demons and those that are not surrounded with demons. They're surrounded with holy angels. So you have a differentiation between those on the earth because of who they associate with. And yes, it is guilt by association in this case. You are associating with the evil influences of demons and as a result you will be influenced you'll be changed but in this case you will be blessed by your associations if you're spending time with the good influence of holy angels then you are being blessed by the glory of god so really the difference is, is between the sheep and the goats if you will is who they spend their time with and really i think we need to be spending our time with holy angels to be able to do uh, receive the blessings that they have that's why Christ had an angel sent to him in the wilderness of temptation. That's why Christ had an angel sent to him in the garden of Gethsemane is because God needed to strengthen and encourage and empower him to be able to continue living for him contrary to either Satan's will in the garden of temptation or his own will in the garden of Gethsemane. Both were contrary to God's will, Satan's will and not my will be done, but thine. So either way, Christ was able to have angelic help to overcome that evil desire, which was completely refused by Christ. We know that because he was victorious. But that evil desire was to go contrary to God's will. And what was the help from God? It was angels. And so what we need are angels as well, right? I don't want to be Babylonian associating myself with evil spirits. I want to be God's holy people that are preparing for the coming of Christ, surrounded with the glory of God, which is with his holy angels, okay? So I thought that was really fascinating, being able to see that there in the book of Revelation, so I wanted to share it with you. Going back now to Exodus chapter 37, 
He made two angels of gold beaten out of one piece made he them with, of course, part of the uh, mercy seat. And on the two ends of the mercy seat is where they were. One cherub on the end of this side, the other cherub on the other side. Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubim. So it's all of the same thing on the two ends thereof. Those That uh, mercy seat actually had, as part of it, two cherubim on the two ends thereof. The cherubim, what did they do? They spread out their wings on high. And notice, covered with their wings over the mercy seat. Now, who's the mercy seat? Christ is represented as the mercy seat according to Romans chapter 3. So, these angels are covering with their wings the mercy seat. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. It means the mercy seat was under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. the angels are not the Almighty. No, but they are the ones that cast shadow for the Almighty. Well, why doesn't the Almighty cast shadow for himself? Because God is light, you understand. God is light. Light doesn't have shadows. Like, look at I'm looking at a light right here. I'm looking at a light right there because I'm in the studio. And they don't have shadows. I mean, I kind of, I, there is because it's not perfect. But God is light, right? And whatever light there is doesn't have shadows. If you have something that stops the light from reaching some location, then you have a shadow. But it's God's object that is casting that shadow. Therefore, it is the shadow of the Almighty. That doesn't make the angels almighty. Absolutely not. They're the tools of the Almighty. And so the mercy seat is under the shadow of the Almighty. You can read it right there. I'm going to read it again with you. The cherubims spread out their wings on high and covered with their wings over the mercy seat with their faces one toward another, even toward the mercy seat word were the faces of the cherubim. Okay, so they're basically looking at each other, but their faces are down, okay? And their wings are overshadowing the mercy seat. Therefore, the mercy seat has a shadow because God is high and lifted up. In fact, the Bible calls him the most high. God is not lower than the angels. God is the most high. And if there are wings underneath the most high, yet they're over the mercy seat, we have the shadow of the almighty, okay? I think it's fascinating. I, just learning these things is, is beautiful to me. And I want to be able to share them with others. By the way, I put out a video recently, and it was an invitation to study the, the truth about God. And there was one person that replied immediately. In fact, within minutes, he said, you know, I'm not really interested in the topic of the Trinity. It just hasn't been a catch to me at all. But since watching your messages about the angels, I'm very interested. Where should I start? I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. And since then, there's been many others that have uh, commun communed with me as well and tried to find out more details. But the point is this. Angels are drawing people to the truth. That's actually part of their job. And as we understand more about the angelic ministry, we are as you were, as it were, under the shadow of the Almighty because they have protected us by God's direction, God's command. In fact, the Bible calls it his charge. God has charged them to work with you, to keep you from dashing your feet on a stone, lest you stumble in the way. You can read that in similar words in Psalm 91. Start in verse 10 and 11, you'll see it right there. And so here, the um, angels are covering the mercy seat. I think it's beautiful because Christ was covered 100% of the time by God because Christ never chose to leave the presence of his Father. And so what you have here is the cherubims carrying, like we read in Revelation 18, the glory of God covering Christ, the mercy seat, and Christ never chose to turn away from the cover that God had sent for him which, of course, when their faces were one toward another, toward the mercy seat. Now, what does that mean? Go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, like, I think it's 10-ish. Yes, but I'm going to go a couple verses before that. You have not seen Christ, but you love him, in whom, though you have not seen him, <clears throat> yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the ends of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation, which is the salvation of your souls, the prophets have inquired, and they have searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace, which was in Christ, that should come unto you. 
searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in the prophets, did signify. Ah, the Spirit of Christ signified. You remember, the Bible teaches in Revelation 1 verse 1 that Christ signified the message by his angel. And so the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Ah, how was that Spirit in them? And how was it signified? Revelation 1 verse 1, I think, explains it. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. When it testified, what was it that testified? It was the Spirit of Christ that testified. What did it testify of? It testified of the sufferings of Christ. So the Spirit of Christ was testifying of himself, of course, in the grammatical third person. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. And the glory that should follow. Of course, so what you have here is this uh, Spirit was testifying of himself. So in other words, John chapter 16, verse 8, when it's talking about the Spirit speaking of himself, it's not meaning this exact thing. That's not what it's saying. It's speaking differently. And I've already talked about that, I think, in this session, so I'm not going to go further. But notice, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. The prophets ministered the things that were given to them by the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things even the angels desire to look into, which is what? The salvation of your souls and the ministers signifying with the Spirit of Christ, the ministers being the angels, signifying what Christ had spoken, testifying of himself and the glory that should follow, the sufferings of Christ, the salvation of your souls, all those things that are revealed. These things are what the angels desire to look into. And I believe that's why it's saying their faces were one toward another, and even to the mercy seat word were the faces of the cherubims. Okay, So that to me is exciting because I'm interested in the gospel, and I want to associate with others that are even more interested in the gospel than I am. Who would they be? They're the ministers of God, the angels. And if we can co-work with the angels, we can learn from them, from their experience and their knowledge, as it says in early, no, 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 education, page 270. Then we, we can grab the things that are the deep things of God because they're revealed to us from those that are actually commissioned to bring his glory to the world, like we read in Revelation 18. Contrary, of course, to those that would rather spend time with the unclean spirits and the, uh, the foul, um, well, the unclean devils and foul spirits, right? Something like that, I don't remember. The devils, the habitation of devils, the unclean spirits or the evil spirits and the unclean and hateful birds, I think is what it says anyways in Revelation 18. Now, so going back here to Exodus 37, verse 10, he made the table. This is different now. This is not the ta This is no longer the Ark of the Covenant. We're talking about now the table of showbread. He made the table of shatim wood, just like everything else is in that section. Two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit and a breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Okay. He overlaid it with pure gold. And there's nothing on the inside because it was just basically a, a table, not something that you would put something inside of it. But he made thereunto a crown of gold round about it. Ah. And also he made thereunto a border of a handbreadth round about and made a crown of gold for the border thereof round about it. So now there's two crowns on this one table of showbread. There's a crown of gold. There's a border of a handbreadth and then another crown of gold for the border thereof round about. So this table of showbread actually has two crowns. Kind of like the Ark of the Covenant has one crown, but there's another crown elsewhere. It's on the table, or sorry, the altar of incense, okay? Because there's the high priest that's ministering the incense before the Ark of the Covenant. And that's why we can see two crowns there during the Day of Atonement, where you have both of those associated in the most holy place in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, so here you have, there's always two crowns on the table of showbread because both the Father and the Son were in the holy place, just like the Father and the Son are in the most holy place, okay? So you have two crowns in both places. I think that's important because really you have two that are sitting on the throne. One is called the Father or the uh, Prince of Peace. So let me, let me say it this way. One is the Prince of Peace, which would be Jesus Christ, 
And the Bible calls the other the king of peace. You can read that. I believe it's in Romans 15. I'm going to just search it real quick for myself. King of peace. And it's Hebrews chapter 7. There it is. Romans 15. And it is the, maybe it's the God of peace. I don't remember. The God of hope. There it is. The God of hope. That's where I was misunderstanding. So you have the, and the God of peace, something like that. There's, it's around here somewhere. You can look for it yourself, but Christ is, I thought the Prince of peace and, and God, the father is the God of peace. So you'd have to find it for yourself, but now I'm totally distracted. Anyways, going back to Exodus chapter 37, verse 11, he overlaid it with pure gold and made thereunto a crown of gold thereabout. Now, so we're talking about the two crowns of gold in the holy place. Now, here we have the table of showbread with a crown, and then there's a handbreadth and another crown. One crown is on the inside of the other crown. And I think that's really important to understand because what we have in Revelation chapter 4, for example, is God the Father alone. He is the only one on the throne in Revelation chapter 4. But there comes in chapter 5, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When John turned around to see the Lion of the tribe of Judah, what he sees is a lamb as it had been slain. And that lamb is able to grab from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne the scroll. And of course, that was so that he could take it in his hand and sit down. So he was able to overcome and sit on the throne. And that's why they were praising everybody. Uh, rather, everybody was praising the one that sits on the throne and also of the lamb. And that's because they're both ruling. They're both sitting on the throne. So what you have is on the table of showbread, which is illustrated there in Revelation 4 and 5, you have one crown, which is actually symbolized, I think, by the glory of the Lord. And it's a rainbow round about the throne. And you have another that comes into that glory that's actually before the father as a lamb that had been slain. Well, he has a crown, but it's within the crown, if you will. And that's what I believe is here described with the uh, table of showbread is you have a crown within a crown. So there's a crown on the outside, which would be that of the father. And there's another one that's on the inside. And so you have the father and the son. But that's exactly what you have is you have a father and a son. You don't have two gods. Well, sure, Jesus is our God because he's the son of God, but that doesn't mean he's the God of his father. The father is the God of Christ. <clears throat> and so you have this co-working together that, that works perfectly. It's not a conflict. It's not something confusing. Some people are saying, you're, you're, you're diminishing Christ by making him the son. It's like a demigod or a lesser God. I actually was asked that just yesterday. No, it's not. What we have is the God of the Bible that has a son. And that son has been gifted the throne. And that son has a crown because he overcame sin because of the strength and power of his father. And so what you have is this co-working together of a father and a son. Not two gods. You have a father and a son. You see what I'm doing there with the hands? One is higher than the other. The highest. The greater. The one that does not have a god. But his son that actually does have a God. His son submits to his father and worships him as his father. The son prays to his father. The father has never prayed to the son, to my knowledge. And, you know, I'm just saying that because it's not revealed, but that, to me, I don't see the father ever praying to the son. They commune together, they talk together, but the father doesn't ask anything of anybody. In fact, the Bible says, why, if I need something, would I come to you? You can't help me out. That's in the Psalms, but I don't remember exactly where. Anyways, going back to uh, Exodus 37, so there's a crown round about it, and then there's a border, and then there's a crown round about that, which is the uh, hand breadth away from the first crown. And he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings upon the four corners that, uh, that are in the feet thereof, and it was to carry it as well. Over against the border were the rings, the places for the staves to, as it says, carry it, bear the table. And he made the staves of shatim wood and overlaid them with gold to bear the table, again, to carry it. And he made vessels which were upon the table, the dishes, the spoons, the bowls, and his covers to cover withal, of pure gold. So all the vessels were of gold, and uh, all those vessels, by the way, had to be anointed. You're going to read that in chapter 40. And that's why Christ went into the most holy place at the ascension. Yes, at the ascension. And it wasn't to start the ministry of the most holy place. It was to anoint all the vessels for the ministry. And so Christ did go into the most holy place at the ascension for the purpose of anointing, but then he came back and started his ministry for 1810 years in the holy place. And then later in 1844, he entered into the most holy place for ministry. Okay, 
So that little bit of information could have really helped a lot of confusion in the late 18, I'm uh, sorry, 1970s. But, uh, you know, I guess that, that wasn't well known. But for me, it just makes really good sense. Anyways, go back to uh, the Bible here. So he made the vessels and they were all anointed, like it says in Exodus 40. But he made the candlestick of pure gold. So now we're, we're in the same paragraph, but we are talking about something different. It's a uh, candlestick. He, there's no paragraph insignia here. And so it says, he made the candlestick of pure gold. This is different than what we just read about, which was the table of showbread. It was of beaten work, made he the candlestick. And you know that Christ was in the midst of the candlesticks in Revelation chapter 1. But also, you know, you are the light of the world, as it says in Matthew chapter 5, because we have, we're literally pictured by the light of the world, because he says, you are the light um, that is going to shine forth so that people can see your works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So he made the candlestick of pure gold. It represents Christ first and the spirit of Christ in the hearts of his people crying, Abba, Father, as it reads in Galatians 4, verse 6. But it also represents you, like I said in Matthew chapter 5. He made the candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work made he the candlestick. And the pure gold is Christ, for sure. And that's why it first represents Christ. But Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's the divine nature in you. Okay, that's the spirit of Christ, which is the divine nature in you. Of beaten work made he the candlestick. So he had to shape it kind of like Christ was um, in the form of a man, but in the form of God also. So he was shaped, if you will, the candlestick was, his shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, which I understand are like uh, buds, okay? So they're, it's something that encircles, and the only other way it's translated is upper lintel of the doorpost. So the upper lintel would be like the, uh, the place where in some cases I hit my head, or I would if I didn't duck because I'm taller than some doors. But um, let's see. So that's like a, a, an encircling or a bud, if you will. So they have the branches, the bowls, the buds, or the knops, and his flowers. Where, or sorry, were of the same, the same gold. Six branches going out of the sides thereof. Thereof being the one candlestick. The candlestick is singular. There is one candlestick and it has six branches from that one stick. Three branches of the candlestick, singular, out of the one side thereof, and three branches out of the candlestick out of the other side thereof. I think that's really interesting because I used to think it was candlesticks, seven of them. Nope, it's one candlestick with six branches. And then it says three bowls made of the fashion of almonds. So three bowls on the uh, three branches on one side. So three bowls made of the fashion of almonds in one branch, a bud and a flower, and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knop and a flower. So throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. And what's really interesting is you have um, the flowering rod in the most holy place, but you have the flowers on the candlestick here in the holy place. Now they both represent ministry. Of course, the flowering bud would represent Aaron's ministry specifically as he was called out compared to all the others that threw their rods in as well with the um, rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. You can read about that in Numbers 16, I believe it is. I don't remember, but I think that's true. But then you have here the flowering of this same kind of thought, not the flowering bud, but the flowering on the branches. Hey, a rod and branches. That's interesting. The branches and their rods. Uh, the rod is kind of the same material. They're both wood. Um, they both come from trees. They both have flowers. And so I think it's in both cases ministry. It's the ministry how God has appointed it to be, not as how Korah, Dathan, and Abiram want it to be, which of course they represent Satan. You can see that in that story of Numbers 16. So here you have these, the, the ministry of Christ of course, made completely of gold, which is the divine nature, but we're represented by those candlesticks. That's why Christ is in the midst of the candlesticks there in Revelation chapter 7, is because he is in the midst of his people. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what's being illustrated there by chapter 1 and, and Christ being there amidst those candlesticks. He is there personally. How? It is by his angel. That's why he said in Revelation 22, verse 16, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And 
Christ was in the midst of those candlesticks, and the candlesticks represented the churches. And so Christ is in the churches, but how was it sent? Through the ministration of angels. And so that thought there with the angelic ministry and the two angels over the, the mercy seat here with the shadow of the mercy, I'm sorry, the shadow of the Almighty, and all the other stuff helps us to better understand in the sanctuary how God is working with humanity. And that's why there's angels on the veil and angels on the sides of the walls and angels on the mercy seat. There's angels all over the sanctuary. The priests themselves actually represent the angels that are going not only to and fro in the holy and most holy place, well, sorry, the holy place because they don't go into the most holy place, that's only the high priest. But then you have those priests that are also interacting with those on the earth that are coming with the sacrifice, the lamb into the door. Christ is the door. You have been surrounded by the white garments of Christ, which is in the uh, tabernacle or the outer court of that sanctuary. So when you come into the door, you're surrounded by his righteousness. That's imputed righteousness. And then, of course, as you uh, gain victory by his power over sin, that is the imparted righteousness. So again, we uh, talk about that as I think we did yesterday. But here, looking back at this um, three bowls made of the fashion of almonds, you have in the candlestick were four, four bowls made like almonds and his knops and his flowers, representing the ministry, of course, the, the life that comes from death. Because, you know, it looks like um, an almond tree, for example. It looks like it's dead. There's just branches. But then there's buds and there's flowers. Because if you are working with the Father and his Son through the ministration of their spirit, then what you have is you have the um, seeds that are planted, which come up as buds and flowers, right? And they will produce fruit, in this case, almonds. And so that's, that's the ministry. That's the life of God in you, if you will. And a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches going out of it, it being the candlestick. So the knops and the branches, um, rather, or the flowers, rather, are supposed to be, um, it l seems like they're supposed to be set in such a way that, that they are similar, okay? And it's not that they can just be placed at random, and then so you have kind of this weird-looking candlestick. They, it's supposed to be symmetrical. That's the word I was looking for. And that's because God is a God of order. And everything he did, it needed to be, according to the wisdom he gave to Bezalel, um, symmetrical, beautiful, just as it should be. And I really like that because God wants our characters to be symmetrical as well. And also he wants us to be able to do ministry in a symmetrical way, not just haphazard and random, but he wants us to be able to have a goal, a focus, and to do it in a way that makes sense not wasting money, not wasting time, not wasting energy, but doing things that actually matter. Because Satan knows that his time is short. Don't you think God does too? And so we both know the enemy and those that are on God's side. We know that time is short. We can't just be wasting time. And so I think all of this is summed up in the idea of the candlestick. Going back now to verse 21, or now 22. Their knops and their branches were of the same. Okay, so... They uh, of the same metal, that's the gold. All of it was the beaten work of pure gold. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. So there are seven lamps. That's what you're seeing there in the uh, book of Revelation. Those seven lamps, or candlesticks in this case, uh, in that case rather, the seven lamps would be representing us. We are the light of the world. This is like the, the flame, if you will. And that's what you use to put out the flame is a snuffer or a snuff dish. That's where you hold the snuffers. Of, they're, they're all of pure gold. Of one talent of pure gold made he it and the vessels thereof. So a talent, that's like 70 pounds to my understanding according to what I found out about the talents uh, that will be similar to the um, hailstones in the seventh plague. So a new paragraph now. He made the incense altar of the same kind of wood, shatim wood. Now watch this, the incense altar, right? The length of it was a cubit, the breadth of it was a cubit. It was four square. Two cubits was the height of it, and the horns thereof were of the same, the same what? The same um, uh, gold or material. He overlaid it with pure gold, or maybe they're saying the horns were of the same um, shatim wood. That might be it. 
I'm not sure what's being said there necessarily, but it seems like everything else has been saying of the same, of the same material. So they're probably made of shatim wood, and he overlaid it, which is the entire altar, with pure gold, both the top of it and the sides thereof round about, and the horns of it. So yes, the horns were made of the same um, shatim wood, because the horns were covered with that same gold. Also he made unto it a what? A crown of gold round about. So there's a one crown on the Ark of the Covenant, and there's one crown on the altar of incense. So therefore you have two crowns associated with the most holy place, as, re, as it reads in Hebrews chapter 9. And there are two crowns on that one altar of showbread, or table of showbread, which represented the ministry in the holy place. So then it says, He made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof, by the two corners of it, upon the two sides of it, to be placed uh, for the staves to bear it withal. So they're going to carry it with those those rings, as it said before. Now, with this table of showbread, there are two stacks of bread. You can read that in Leviticus. You can find it. It's not hard to find. And those two stacks of bread each have six in them. Now, why six in each? Why not seven and then five? Like God the Father is greater than the other? Well, they are equal. The Father and the Son are equal in their authority. They're both sitting on the throne. So what happens is whoever listens to the command of the Father, it's the same as though they are listening to the command of the Son. In the same way, also, if you listen to the command of the Son, it's the same as listening to the command of the Father because they are equal in their authority. They're both seated on the throne with the six, if you will. But the Father is the Most High. You can see that in the Most Holy Place. There's no question about that. And so the equality of their ministry, I believe, is what's being described here, or the the equality of their authority. And so you have those two stacks of bread. Now, I know that when you share the truth about God, there are people that will respond saying that the Holy Ghost is a third God. It's called tritheism. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And somehow they don't know how, but the Holy Spirit is some kind of thing that is God, but is a little bit more humble because you don't really read about him and and see him uh, displayed as you do the Father and the Son. That was actually in one of the Sabbath school quarterlies years back. But so what you have is this idea of not only two on the throne, like it reads in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, where you have two stacks of six. If you had the Holy Ghost on the throne, you'd have three stacks of six. What would that make? 666. We know that, right? And so we understand that uh, that's not something we want to say or do. We want to know what the Bible teaches and not try to add to it. So the Holy Ghost doesn't have a throne. The Holy Ghost doesn't have a crown. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God's Son sent forth into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So really, it's, it's not a third being necessarily. It can be a third person grammatically in that God the Father speaks of himself that way. And the Son of God speaks of himself that way as well. So like I said the other day, if I say to you, God loves you. Really, it was God that was saying through me, God, in the grammatical third person, loves you. Now, if Christ says that through me, and if I say Jesus loves you, Jesus is speaking of himself in the grammatical third person, and he's speaking through me, one of his vessels. And so you have this interaction of the third person of the Godhead that is interacting with and through us, And we are literally part of the kingdom of God, helping share the message of God's spirit or God's love, God's truth, his character, his will. And so that makes you a very important part of the kingdom of heaven and me too, because we are co-working together with his spirit, with his mind, with his life. And of course, the angels are doing the same. So we're trying to interact with God and co-work with him just so that we can spread his gospel to as many as possible. And that includes the Holy Spirit, or the third person of the Godhead. Not third person in the Godhead, no such thing. Anyways, going back here, there's um, Exodus 37, 27. He made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof, for the corners of it, or by the corners, upon the two sides thereof, to be places where the staves will be able to carry this um, uh, table of showbread. Um, Sorry, are we talking about the table of showbread? No, this is the uh, altar of incense, sorry. And it says, He made the staves of shatim wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil. Remember, this oil was to be made of sweet spices, pure incense and sweet spices, according to the work of the apothecary. Now, this is um, 
It's somebody who actually makes perfume. It's the, those that work with compounds or ointments, spices, etc. Now, remember, this is something that you're not supposed to ever make and put on any other thing. This is a specific kind of anointing oil that will be made for those in the service of the sanctuary. So think about that. I know a song um, where it's by Michael Card, and I don't remember the name. It's been a long time since I've heard of it, but he sings about the smell of angels. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. But now that I've studied this, this book in detail, I get it. I wonder if he knew that the holy anointing oil was for the ministers, but also anointing the vessels as well. And so if it's true that this holy anointing oil would be on the high priest, the priests, and all the vessels thereof, then sure, they're going to smell. And the angels would be the ones that have a certain scent, a certain uh, like aura about them, if you will. Like you can smell the demons, they're not smelling very good, but you smell the holy angels and you're like, wow, I really like that. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's kind of the same thing. Smell, taste, see, feel, hear. And God is trying to reach us in every way possible. And, you know, it's, it's really nice when you feel the presence of God, whether you're in nature or a friend comes in at the right time. There was once where I was a Bible worker in Northern California. And for days I was just down. I just, I didn't know why. I just was down. Like I had a pressure on my shoulders and I just felt like I wasn't wanting to smile. I didn't want to sing. I didn't really want any of that stuff. But my friend, uh, dear brother Brent Brousset, he said, Daniel, how are you doing? I said, you know, man, I'm just not, I'm not feeling it right now. I'm just not doing very well. He goes, can I pray with you? I said, yeah, I'd like that. And so he prayed with me and it was during that prayer. It, it wasn't like at a certain point in the prayer. It was just like, as he started, it was like water, fresh water filled my soul. And I just, I got up af off my knees after that prayer. I was a different person. It just was like, wow. And that's kind of like the sweet smell, if you will, or the sweet taste that's the sound of angelic singing, if you will. It's just, you, you feel that sometimes where you're around the Spirit of God in a way that you just know it's there. And it's, it's like this. You smell that coming downwind from the sanctuary. You're, you're like, ah, oh, that's the, the smell of God's ministry, you know? And I wonder if he didn't do that. God didn't do that on purpose to bring people to kind of just get the sense of well, using all their senses, the smell, the sight, the taste, the, 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 the touch and everything. And like, I think that means God is trying to win us through every way possible. And I like that. I want God to win me with every ability that he has, because I really want to be with him. I want to be with his son. I want to be with the heavenly angels. And I want to be with those that are the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages. So if you want to be like that with me, then let's pray one more time and let's continue to surrender ourselves to the words of God. This is why he has sent them. His words are life and spirit, and he wants us to be able to partake of his life and his spirit, the divine nature. And so as we commit ourselves to prayer, let's also commit ourselves to continue to study that we can show ourselves approved unto God workmen that are needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we ask that you'd please continue to bless us, that as we seek your face, your word, your truth, your life, that we would be blessed, we would be led, we'd be able to understand what it is that your Spirit is saying to the churches, that we can be taught by angels as you have sent your angel in Revelation twenty two sixteen. We ask that you'd please continue to lead and guide us, that we could be a blessing to as many as possible, sharing the truth about your ministers, the angels, your son, the high priest, yourself, the Most High, and your broken law that can be kept and should be kept as Christ was able to give us an exemplification here on this earth. We ask that you'd please continue to lead and guide us, that we can serve you in the greatest capacities possible in each of our lives with our friends, our family, our neighbors, those that are near and far. However we can, help us to do this with and for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, any thoughts from what we've learned today? 
The snuffers and other utensils. You know, Jim, I'm not sure if they have meanings. <clears throat> they were practical, I'll tell you that. But I, I'm not positive of the meaning, so if you ever learn anything, please let me know. The God of peace. Ah, there it is. Revelation 15:33. The God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of peace. God is the God of peace. Thank you, Brother Robert. I appreciate you looking for that. Uh, Hebrews also, if you query a God of peace, it's it's quite a quite a few times it's hit in the Bible. Like Hebrews 13:20 says, "Now the God of peace that brought you again from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ." So that would be the Father as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. And Amen. So that's it's, that's pretty amazing, you know. So that's nice. Amen. Uh, um, I, I found uh, some some hits on some stuff. I was thinking about Shekinah glory and how uh, God's uh, presence is there in the most holy. Yes. And um, you know the the angels and the cherubims are are, are beat uh, out of one piece of gold um, and covering that. And so I you talked about angels you know, protecting and uh, found uh, a pretty nice. Uh, quote here from Ellen White, from Steps to Christ. Okay. If you don't mind, I'll read that. It says, He longs to give us divine grace, and as we draw nigh to God with full assurance of faith, our spiritual conceptions are quickened. We do not then walk in blindness, blooming our spiritual barrenness. barrenness. For by a diligent, prayerful searching of the word of God, we apply his rich promises unto our soul. Angels draw us close to our side, and the enemy, with his manifold devices, is drawn back. I think that's it's uh, that's beautiful, and it just reminds me of covering. In other words, we're, we're covered. He's going to draw us back. So, you know, we have to believe these things, and it's interesting. She says, by faith, you know, we, we God will draw near to us with the full assurance of faith. So our faith, you know, it, it's uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. Amen. And then, uh, yeah, I love that angels draw near. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, what did I miss that? Oh, well, I hey, put, well, uh, well, uh, Edward, while you're looking for that, I'll just mention <laughs> that I did a presentation a while back. I was in Idaho at the time. It was um, Angels in Steps to Christ. Mm. And uh, I basically just went through that book and looked at every time the word angel oh. or angels comes up, and it's fascinating, really powerful. Oh, Wow, Steps to Christ, yeah, it's probably yeah, all over the place. Uh, let me have a see. Oh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I can, anybody can find this if you query this, but this text, it's in 2.9. I'm not sure if this is still Hebrews or, or not, but, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, you probably know that, that text, the yes, holy yes. nation. Peter, okay, say yeah, I said Peter, uh, ye are a, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into this marvelous light. I mean, wait a minute, marvelous light. Christ was in the holy, right? And he moved into the most holy, into that marvelous light. And, and I don't know if there's a correlation there. But I thought I'd ask you that question. You, you, yeah, I don't know, but I, you know, now my imagination may have just ran ran wild. <laughs> I thought I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, like Christ went into the most holy, the priest went into the most, so they went into that most marvelous light. Yes, I mean, that, that's your kind of glory. So I was Amen. thinking all that stuff. I, yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I like I like that too. I, I haven't done. I just stumbled on it and stuff. That thought, but uh, there's something else that I wanted to ask you about the covering. Uh, why not out of pure uh, gold? Uh, it was wood. And then uh, I think it was, well, uh, I, I don't know, right? I was going to highlight it here and I, I forgot to. I thought I'd put a red question mark here about my notes. Sometimes I get going so fast, I get so many notes that uh, I got to really keep track of my mind. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Well, I, I forget that one. But anyhow, if you go to verse 16, it says, uh, you mentioned anointing all the vessels yes. for the ministry. And I thought, you know, oh, that's, maybe there's, that's why they, um, I remember, uh, as a deacon in the church, uh, a new pastor would would come in and what have not, and they before they would present him, they anoint him because you know he's a vessel for the Lord right. you know, to, to preach, and so they they anoint him. And I I'm sure there's probably some parallel. Maybe that's where they got this from. I bet that's um, true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the, but but like us too, you know, we, the Lord is supposed to anoint us right Amen. with with, yes. his, Amen. with his word. 
and right. uh, it is so pure. But anyhow, so I just those thoughts I had. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it.